So a lot of the bigger named um, artists, watercolor artists in England, um, Amanda Hyatt, and uh, they, they just kind of paint traditional landscapes. I think I'm going to have to move to England. But um, again, these examples were um, posted in our Facebook group as, as kind of some challenges and stuff too here. But as I go through, you know, Instagram uh, and stuff now with the social media, um, it also kind of strikes me. Um, it's not just England and America. As I go around, um, I follow some Iranian artists and they all, not all, but um, there's a lot of this kind of very similar style of painting too. Um, this artist, Faruja, is really um, talented. I like her work quite a bit. Um, and very, again, very colorful, very simple stylized shapes, okay? Um, that seems to be kind of a hallmark of some of my favorite Iranian watercolor artists. Um, almost an abstract, but it's still representational. Uh, this guy's work is amazing, Ali Golbaz. Um, I recommend finding him on Instagram if you haven't already. I love his watercolors. Uh, but the same kind of thing, very kind of simplified shapes, a little bit of stylized, um, using the white of the paper quite a bit too. Uh, just a really kind of getting down to the essence of, of things. Um, again, those are some nice examples of his work. Um, another gentleman from Iran, Ahmad Mogadisi, is um, his work is, I think you can see what I'm talking about. It's almost when I flip through Instagram and you see a painting, you can tell where that artist is from. It's amazing. Um, uh, but I just love that simple treatment of, of watercolor. And again, it's very Persian. A lot of the Turkish artists and Iranian artists are all, all kind of paint that same uh, style. And uh, let's see here. India is kind of the same way. Some of the more well-known Indian artists. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Praful Sawant is um, pretty well-known. He teaches a lot. He's all over Instagram. But when I look at it, very calligraphic, um, a lot of strong color in their work too, almost like Alvaro Castanier, who kind of a deal um, with some of the landscapes. But again, a lot of calligraphy. Um, Amit Kapoor is very well known to um, kind of a little bit more stylized shapes, kind of like Iran, but a lot more involved, a lot more kind of hectic and colorful. And again, when I go through the work and I see, or I'm not flipping through Instagram and you see a painting, you almost don't even have to look at the name of the artist. I can see where it is. Now, obviously, a lot of this is recognizable because of the architecture, okay? Uh, when I'm going through this in the landscape, they're painting their landscape. But even when they're not painting in their homeland of India, if they're somewhere else, their style um, doesn't really change that much. I wonder if that has to do you know, with um, just their life, how, how hectic it is there, and how many people are there, and the, the colors that they wear, um, have on their clothing and on the shops and stuff, and it's very um, reflected in their work, a lot like the, the British artists with the gray and green landscapes and a little bit more pastoral, okay? We don't associate England other than London as a bustling, colorful place. Uh, so that obviously plays a large role in their work. Another Indian artist here. The lend is uh, very talented, um, but same kind of stuff, very colorful, calligraphic. Yet another Vikrant is a nice, uh, has a nice style here too. But this is what I'm saying, you know, this plein air painting. When you look out at the landscape in front of them, all, all the shapes, the noise, the colors, you know, the calligraphy, that's obviously reflected in their work too. But um, you know, but they're still painting um, the landscape. And again, going back to the, the English guys and how, how simple they keep everything. Uh, nice and clean. So, <clears throat> oh, and then going back to Australia and the tradition there. When you look at, um, this is Harold Herbert's work and um, he lived around the turn of the century. Um, some old watercolor paintings. He was also an oil painter too, but I think you can see his style and how that might have influenced um, some of the current uh, Australian watercolorist too. It's a little bit more um, natural in the colors, very similar to the British. Nice and clean style. Okay, that's another Harold Herbert. Uh, but the landscape in Australia, the, the large open spaces that they have, 
that informs their work as well. That's a beautiful painting, obviously not Australia, but um, his work is amazing. I recommend you kind of investigate him as well. Harold Herbert, Theodore Penley Boyd is another one here. That's a beautiful, simple landscape. Okay, again, very kind of English, but um, even more with the, the vast open spaces, kind of like the American West or the Hudson River School in America, you know, with how much land they have out there. So they kind of sticking to more of the uh, traditional um, style of, of painting. And of course, the gum trees. Australia is uh, noted for the gum trees. So this is, uh, again, Penley Boyd. Oh, boy, that is beautiful, huh? Look at that big connected shape, what I'm talking about, all those all those lost edges that we see in there. Um, just soft edges. There's hardly, I mean, it just kind of goes right from shore into the shadow everywhere all the way across. Love that. And then, so those were a couple of... Um, the uh, watercolor artists from the past and then we look at some of the more recent ones Ross Patterson and again with the gum trees okay but you're seeing a lot of that same kind of a style painting the the um, open landscape a little bit more natural colors uh, when you see it it's not just the the gum trees that makes it recognizable Casey Seeley is another contemporary um, Australian watercolor artist back to the gum trees um, a lot of high key paintings the light there the bright light and kind of the dusty um, conditions that you might see in, in parts of Australia is reflected in their work too. I like Casey Seeley's work quite a bit also. Um, and then of course Joseph Zbukovich, kind of the same thing, his, his landscapes um, reflecting a lot of that same kind of mentality of the, the vast open spaces and a little bit more of the, the natural colors and again the gum trees um, which makes it very recognizable. So going back to the uh, the AWS show, um, and again that whole uh, concept of artists being influenced by other um, artists in their country. Now, obviously, that's going to happen as you paint. You um, you start to spend time with um, your contemporary painters and going to their shows, and and um, you start to influence each other more. And it happened more in the past, I think, because you didn't have social media, obviously. So. Um, nowadays, we can scroll through our phone and find examples of watercolor painting on a daily basis, you know, flooding us from around the world. But back then, you were a little bit more influenced by people in your in your backyard. Um, so it was only natural that you kind of develop similar styles and tastes and the tastes that you're kind of um, appealing to and your countrymen for sales and everything, too. But how did this kind of stylized uh, approach to watercolor come about? In, in America. And when you go back, I think, um, and again, this is just kind of my theory, um, but when watercolor first really took hold in this country, it was back in the um, 1920s and 30s and 40s. And uh, the big names in watercolor at that time were um, out in California. Um, the California watercolor scene, the very uh, expressionist, and that's when abstract expressionism was obviously kind of taking hold across the, around the world too, and and the New York art scene. So these were some of the, this is Don Kingman work, and um, so these were again some of the most famous early watercolor artists in this country, and uh, this was the kind of work that they that they did, very highly stylized. Um, any art that was being taught in universities at that time obviously focused on abstract expressionism too so they were just kind of following um, the lead the movement of what was happening around the world uh, more Don Kingman's work I'm just kind of flip through some of these examples here but kind of an interesting abstracted uh, approach to the land there's still landscapes obviously but um, they're highly stylized very interesting. A lot of patterns, a lot of shapes, a lot of uh, values. It's almost um, kind of planned out more as an abstract than a landscape initially. Um, and then you're kind of working on the uh, coming up with some of the recognizable aspects of a landscape. Emil Cosa Jr. was another early California watercolor artist. A lot of thick, this is really kind of abstract expressionism in his work. A lot of darker paint, strong brush work. Um, and again, even when it's more of a recognizable landscape, it's still stylized. Phil Dyke, another one from back then, uh, much more abstracted. 
Road to Santa Barbara. That's a nice painting. But that almost looks like a, could be something that an early Picasso would have done right there um, with watercolor. And, and uh, so and obviously, the, as they were famous, much like today, um, the more well-known artists um, taught and, and exhibited more. So they were more highly influential on, on up-and-comers and, -comers and um, coming up and, and learning the medium. Uh, now this is Rex Brandt. Another one from the same time, the contemporary of theirs. So that that's that's kind of a brief history there of some of the bigger names of that, that early California watercolor scene. Okay, and then like I said, how that relates to um, today, at least in my thought, um, going back to some of the bigger names, I mean, the direct correlation between them and um, Frank Webb, and uh, who taught many, many years, and um, I don't think he's teaching anymore, but he's still winning awards in the American Watercolor Society show. He won another one this year. Um, so his work was obviously, um, again, very much influenced by that style, that abstracted style of watercolor. Okay, so and Frank, because he taught a lot as well, um, influenced people coming up behind him. Very similar um, to those early California watercolors. John Salmonen, a good friend, um, and uh, another very well-known watercolor artist, Dolphin Fellow and press president of AWS. Same kind of thing, um, a little more highly involved, but very abstract, um, kind of working out more of patterns and, and values and stuff. Again, it's a recognizable landscape, but um, very highly stylized. That's an amazing painting of the Paris rooftops. Um, Tony Couch, he's in that book, Watercolor Impressionist, um, and I, I included him here because, like I said, even with uh, more of a recognizable landscape style, um, it's still pretty highly stylized, a lot of the, that white paper showing through, um, bright colors, okay, Tony Couch, Eric Weigart, I took a um, couple of my first workshops from him, <clears throat> excuse me, love his work too. So there wasn't kind of a consistent, recognizable style that was developing um, in the U.S. It was um, all of these artists had, um, you know, their own their own style, but that you wouldn't look at it and say that's American painting, really. Um, the way it's a little bit more easy to to recognize the Australians or the British or the Iranians of today and stuff. It's um, a lot more diverse. But it's still um, kind of based a little bit more on technique than, than than anything else. So, anyways, I just thought you might find that kind of interesting. I wanted to discuss that. I think that was, um, in my opinion, that's kind of how um, the, this preponderance of more stylized uh, water approach to watercolor happened in this country. I don't think. I mean, you're obviously going to see that. Um, around the world, anywhere, but uh, in general, when you look at the shows that are coming up and coming out and you think of England, um, you're not thinking in those terms, you're thinking more of those traditional landscapes, okay? And even, I was going to include some Russian and Chinese paintings in here too, they inform a lot of each other, the, the Russians and the Chinese paint very similarly, I think. Um, and then back to Skip Lawrence, okay, we've done our lessons with him, another icon back then, older guy who was heavily influenced, I'm sure, by the early California watercolorists as well in developing that style. Hi, my name's Andy Evenson. Over the course of this year, I'll be discussing a lot of ways to improve your paintings with a focus on watercolor in particular. Watercolor is a popular medium, but there are technical issues that can become stumbling blocks during the learning process. The painting becomes a lot more fun once you've solved them and can start refining your craft. I'll cover topics that are unique to watercolors, such as painting wet and wet, the timing and consistency of your washes, the importance of drawing and negative shape making, and more. I'll also be talking a lot about how vital it is to have a plan. The transparent nature of watercolor means you're limited in the amount of fixing you can do once you've started, and indecisiveness, that's what leads to the weak, muddy paintings. Because this course spans a calendar year, you'll be able to see me painting outdoors on location as well as in the studio. We can talk about the differences and similarities of both. I've taught dozens of three to five day workshops and most of the time, just as students are starting to figure things out, it's time to say goodbye. This course through Tucson Art Academy Online allows me to work with you for an entire year, so we'll be able to get into things that just aren't possible in a four day workshop. 
As an artist who also loves to teach, I'm really excited about the possibilities of this. I hope you'll join me.